Well, hello. Uh, my name is Jeff Deverter, and I work with a company called CloudReach. And I'm really glad that you guys have been uh, joined us today to talk about application modernization in the cloud era. It's obviously a very popular topic. It's something that is coming up in one form or another in uh, in all circles that we that, that we travel in. So uh, my role inside of CloudReach is as uh, a cloud strategist. And as a cloud strategist, I have the opportunity to speak with countless different types of customers, sizes of customers across every single uh, industry that you can imagine. And there isn't any one single industry today that really isn't uh, grasping and grappling with this challenge of what do they do with their applications? What do they do with their computer assets? What do they do with ultimately is their crown jewels as found in their data in this modern cloud era. How do they make that step from, I've got this stuff running inside of my data center in, uh, in a physical data center somewhere else from a managed co-location or even a managed service provider somewhere, but still running on traditional servers? What's the thought process? What's the, what's the methodology by which we're going to take and pick those assets up and move them out into the cloud? Now, today we're going to go through some thoughts that I have on, on the subject, and these aren't just thoughts that, uh, you know, as I sat down to put this webinar together, that I, that I, that I really just, just kind of came out of, out of nowhere. What this is a result of is years and years of my experience in helping customers uh, leave their data center and move to the cloud. Now, that means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Uh, and has even evolved an awful lot over the past several years as the opportunities and the capabilities that exist for us in the cloud have matured. So let's start to step into this, this presentation, and we're going to use this presentation as a framework. Uh, there is inside of this interface and the ability for you to ask questions. I have absolutely left space at the end for us to engage in those questions. But if you have them as we go along, I'll do my best to keep my eye on that piece of the window. And we will, uh, my goal is to make this more of a conversation than it is about me just presenting some slides to you. So uh, our subject today, of course, application modernization, modernization in the cloud era. So uh, let's see if I can fast forward. This is a little about me. I've been working inside of IT for the better part of 22 years. I have worked inside of enterprise architecture for large Fortune uh, 10 companies in the financial services space. I have uh, been uh, an expert and a presenter and an author in the SharePoint Exchange and Skype world, so very much in the Microsoft space. I have launched in previous companies new business lines inside of uh, those companies that have provided services and helped customers figure out how do they leave their data center for other places, for other opportunities, whether that's the public cloud or in a managed services perspective in a private cloud. In this context, it's meant that I have helped them move into an environment where, where we built new businesses inside of these service providers, and those businesses have ultimately brought those companies over half a billion dollars worth of revenue and it has helped accelerate those end customers who are utilizing those subjects, uh, those, those, those server applications, to greater advance in what they were doing utilizing those, those technologies. So what it's ultimately meant is, is I've built businesses that have translated the value of the cloud into a real strategic business value for them, for those end customers, and how they stop thinking about servers and start thinking about what their business does. Uh, I functioned as the CTO inside of organizations, both uh, at large as well as specific Microsoft technology sets in helping those companies make uh, strategic decisions and long-term roadmaps around technology and ultimately in the cloud. And again, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, I am currently a cloud strategist inside of CloudReach. We are a collection of about five individuals, uh, very targeted, very strategic at some of our largest customers in going in and helping them create roadmaps. How do they modernize their application and turn those into, uh, uh, into real strategic value? Uh, there's a question. Uh, somebody else just, just note uh, if you, you're still hearing me. Um, somebody is, is not able to. So hopefully you, the rest of you are. Uh, all right, so, so that's my current role. Again, I've done this for the past, the better part of uh, the past couple of decades in helping customers leave their data center and move out into the cloud. So today, 
uh, what we want to talk about again is is how do we modernize our applications and uh, in in face of the cloud era. But before we can think about modernizing our current applications, it's important that we look backwards and understand how we got to where we are today. Uh, before we can even think necessarily about what does it mean as we move forward into the future. So when we think about how we got here today, of course, we come out of, uh, and I'm just going to take us back to the mainframe era. In a, in a mainframe era, of course, you know, we have this large central processing environment that takes these large monolithic applications and distributes them to, to terminals to be able to ultimately be able to do whatever this application is that it needed to do. Back in the old days, a lot of data processing going on, a lot of financial processing going on. But that moved us then up into uh, the client-server world, where we broke those, those large mainframe applications up into applications that would run on smaller servers that we could distribute, uh, whether that's across multiple geos in different data centers, or even uh, even breaking some of those applications down into a little bit more of a functional set. And as we now move into where we, and that's by the way where we are today. We are in a, in a uh, if we haven't moved out into the, truly into the cloud, and you're going to see here some, my, I'm choosing the words very carefully. It's not just about moving into the cloud, but it's about modernizing your application along the way. Because you know what, as you move out into the cloud, you can still move applications that behave in a lot of cases, an awful lot like those mainframe applications, but absolutely like client-server applications. And I'm going to cut to the chase on this as well, is if you just pick up a client-server application and move it to the cloud, you have not modernized that application. There are a few benefits you're going to get along the way by doing that, but you haven't modernized your application. We're going to talk about what it means to modernize your application, because as, as we've moved through these, this process of going from a mainframe to client server. We have to think about that development process along the way because we need to look at this holistically. Now one of the areas we aren't necessarily going to address today is specific impacts on business operations. But it's something that does need to be considered as you move to the cloud because it changes the way that your business runs. But if we think specifically about your development life cycle today inside of, well really anything, it can be broken down to as simple as these four steps, from requirements to development to testing to deployment. Now when we think about that simple process uh, in a large client server or monolithic application inside of client server, this development and testing and uh, deployment life cycle is something that was measured in at least in quarters, if not in years. In fact, to use as an example, think about um, think about, about Microsoft Windows, for instance. Microsoft Windows would update itself uh, or there'd be a new version every couple of three years. Why was it every couple of three years? Because it was such a large chunk of code that was dealt with monolithically. So when we went from Windows 98 to Windows 2000 to 2003 and so forth, these were, these were, we were measuring this update cycle in years. Granted, there were service packs along the way to patch, Along towards the end, as we got up towards 2014, 2015, you started to see some, some feature packs come along that were part of it. But ultimately, you didn't see major innovation happening outside of that, of that uh, development lifecycle measured again inside of years. But as, the, as Microsoft specifically uh, uh, became more of a cloud-based company, what you saw was them coming out then with, with Windows 10. And Windows 10, they arguably also said, this is our last version of Windows. You won't see another version of Windows. What you will ultimately see is feature updates along the way. The reason that they were able to create these feature updates along the way and not have to do it holistically and independently is because they broke down a lot of these primary services down into feature components. And those feature components could be dealt with independently. It doesn't mean you get rid of the, the, the requirements, development, testing, life, uh, and deployment lifecycle, but what it means is you're able to do this much more granularly and now take and do this ultimately in a much more agile way. So since there really isn't anything new in this space that's happening like that, what is new in the capabilities that exist that's bringing us to talk about modern applications? 
Well, it's what's happened inside of the cloud. As the primary cloud providers and, and what I'll call the winners have, have reached the top here, uh, you know, if you even think back just a couple of three years, there were a lot of cloud providers out there with a lot of clouds. You, of course, had uh, Microsoft, you had AWS, and you had Google coming along with their public cloud, but you also had, uh, and I guess still to some extent, you still have an IBM cloud out there as, as um, evidenced by SoftLayer. Rackspace still has a public cloud. But what you find if you were to look at Gartner is that really they're only looking at the three primary clouds. You know, uh, Oracle is, is building a very specific cloud. But they're really, the, the Gartners of the world, the foresters of the world are really just focused on what are the, you know, those, those major, and we'll call them hyperscale clouds. And a hyperscale cloud we really should also define as well. The hyperscale cloud is somebody who's doing things at a pace and at a scale that is beyond what a, uh, an IBM software, a Rackspace uh, public cloud could ultimately do just be from a personnel perspective, from a resourcing perspective, and from a geography perspective. The, the rate of investment is just, well, it's hyper. It's, it's, it's crazy and it's big. But what they've also done is not just built more data centers and stuffed them full of more servers, but they've thrown an incredible amount of investment around capabilities inside of there as well. So not only can you host a server, or a virtualized server inside of there, but there are also capabilities and, and platform features that they've built on top of that. For instance, serverless uh, uh, compute, where they've taken those core capabilities and turned them into just services. And now again, no longer do you think about managing a server, but what you're gonna look at and you're gonna manage is the capability uh, that you wanna run there and your core code that is ultimately what is unique and differentiating. Or containers. Containers is one of the ways to, to get into the cloud, in my opinion, the easiest. Containerize your application, move those containers into a managed capability inside of, the, of a public cloud, a hyperscale cloud, and now you can really start to reap some of those benefits that exist inside of, of, the, of the public cloud. So again, we're not getting rid of the requirements, dev, testing, and deployment cycle, but what we're doing is we're getting more and more granular. Or another way to talk about that is we're becoming more and more abstracted from the underlying capability. So let's, uh, let's step forward and start to talk about some of these ways of technology over time that have brought these changes because it's important to also use this foundationally as the capability and the benefits that we get from moving out into the cloud. So when we think about deploying our applications onto servers. Again, these are going to be our more monolithic applications. They are going to be a big fat chunk of code that we have to deal with holistically from the requirements to development to deployment and, or testing and, and uh, into deployment. And the movement of through those different phases is going to be a waterfall move. Um, so we're dealing with servers. Uh, we are dealing with a waterfall development cycle. And that's how we move forward through that, through that process. Now, the next along the lines was when we saw virtualization come along. And virtualization was fantastic uh, and because what it enabled us to do was it enabled us to start to think about that server as something that, that resembled a, um, a transactional piece of something. Because, you know, as we put a hypervisor in place, whether that's VMware or Hyper-V, on top of that, we can start to script into that hypervisor. We can start to control that hypervisor in a way that almost makes it a transactional element. Truly not yet, because when I think transactional elements inside of computing, I'm thinking about things that are, uh, when I think transactional, I think nearly instantaneous, or at least measured in seconds and not measured in minutes. And by and large, when I think about virtualization and spinning up and spinning down of those servers and getting the right um, uh, code base onto those servers, you know, we're not, we're not measuring that in seconds, we're measuring that in minutes. Even in a, even in a, in a very lightweight Linux environment, it's still going to take uh, a little bit of time to get that server online, to get the right code base on that server, to get it added into monitoring, to get it added into uh, the, right, the right management frameworks as well. But that allowed us, virtualization allowed us to start to think about things in an agile function. All right, difference between agile and waterfall. We should really probably address that as well. In a waterfall world, we're back and we're measuring things in that old uh, phase gate approach to, hey, uh, if three months from now we hope to be, have moved our, our code from a true development world into a true functional testing world. 
well, we're, we're, we're dealing with those larger chunks. When we start to deal with smaller pieces of code, we can start to move a little bit faster. In an agile world, we're not measuring in months or years. We're measuring ideally in weeks, and we're not measuring in uh, these phase gate approaches. We're dealing with what we can now call a sprint. And in those sprints, we're actually saying, okay, for these stories, for this specific capability, we hope to be in a testing environment. We hope to have that developed and ready to be looked at from a functional perspective in a matter of just uh, a matter of a couple of weeks, even measuring, of course, we can call that days as well. We talk about 14 days. But we're, we're doing this in tighter and tighter formats. When we think about virtualization, by the way, we're not also necessarily thinking as much about the physical aspects of those servers. We have bifurcated the, the functional role of the system administrator from saying, okay, Ms. System Administrator, manage the server that my code runs on. Now what we're talking about is, okay, system administrator, manage the functional servers that are that 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 where the the, vir, the VMs, the vir, the virtual machines are running. But now I'm taking and I'm, I'm breaking out my infrastructure people from my sysadmins. And that is a pretty big world. Now we lived in that world for, for a long time. The, the, the early 2000s all the way through just even a couple of years ago, that was what our entire world uh, existed on. In fact, entire managed service provider business infrastructures started to exist and to make their mark and build very compelling multi-million, in fact, multi-billion dollar businesses on the fact that they could turn a server on for an enterprise in, in 14 days as opposed to 14 weeks. You know, in 2005, that was impressive. It was impressive to get a server returned back to you, even if it meant the entire physical server itself plus some VMs in 14 days as opposed to 14 weeks, which most enterprises were bound to at that point. But, but it just isn't good enough now. In fact, the businesses that built themselves in that space, those hosting providers back of the, of the 2000s and in early teens, uh, are, are really in uh, a struggle right now as they figure out what their new world was because 14 days just doesn't cut it anymore. But as we move forward now and we look at the evolution of virtualization and agile into this new space, we start to think about microservices. Because they're, they're, if you look at the difference in your application as you moved from a server to, the, to a VM, your application didn't change that much. You probably broke some of things down because now instead of just going out and buying a couple of three servers and that's where everything needed to run and you broke your data down from a, from a, from a client interfacing tier to a business logic tier to uh, a data management tier in the server world, in the VM world, you can start to break those areas up a little bit more. You can start to break up your business logic tier into you know, functional sets of things because now the only real primary cost increase for me to add, go from one VM or two VMs to four VMs or eight VMs really is, is if it's a Windows box, you've got a licensing thing to deal with. If it is a, uh, a, a, an open source based operating system that doesn't have licensing attached to it, uh, aka non-Red Hat, then, um, then I can spawn more and more VMs as I have need to without necessarily increasing a direct licensing cost. I still have a cost a functional cost of having to manage that stuff, having to secure those things, having to patch those things, but I don't necessarily increase additional licensing or 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 third-party costs when when I do that. So we had, didn't see a whole lot of change in the architecture of an application from servers to virtualization, but it absolutely started to get those developers thinking that way. But now as we moved into a microservices world, we can now start to think more in the in the DevOps space. So what, is, what does DevOps mean? Um, uh, so when I think about DevOps, it means I'm thinking about, uh, I'm not necessarily thinking about servers as these functional elements that exist outside of my purview and I have to put in a ticket to have somebody manage. What I'm thinking about is I'm thinking about the infrastructure functioning as much as like code. So if I'm in a, de in a microservices world, I have broken that monolithic application up into functional service capabilities. I'm starting to develop a service catalog that my application functions inside of. Now I really haven't left primarily the virtualization world. A lot of this happened on OpenStack. A lot of it happens in big uh, uh, private cloud deployments. But because we have operationalized those, those now I'm going to call them a private cloud, and I have put automation and capabilities in place that allows me to deal with that infrastructure as code, 
I can now deploy my development environment, I can deploy my test environment, and I can deploy my, um, my production environment not by putting a ticket in and asking the sysadmin team to do that, but what I'm, what I'm doing is, is I'm making it as much a part of the code as my unique application that I'm deploying inside of there. So that's really what, what we've got there. And again, what we're doing here is we are, we are breaking apart this application and it is abstracting the things I used to have to think about. In the server world, I had storage engineers, and those storage engineers were architecting specific um, storage our infrastructure, bits, of, bits of infrastructure to serve my, my application running on my servers. When I moved into the virtualization world, I still had to utilize uh, a, a storage architecture but I'm going to start to access it and to manage it through that, that VMware console. When I move into a, Microsoft, a microservices world, I'm thinking about storage more as a service than I'm thinking about it from a, um, than I'm thinking about the infrastructure specifically. So, so that's absolutely a change that's in place. Now as I move into that, that fourth phase, and this, by the way, is, is stuff that is evolving even now, is I'm less thinking about microservices from a, a world where I have to build the infrastructure on which those services are going to run, and now I'm going to, to utilize in a hyperscale cloud perspective what we would call cloud functions. And what cloud functions does is in the, in the world of microservices, I had to build that microservices architecture or utilize a framework that, that, I, that I bought, begged, borrowed, or stole from somewhere else on the internet and utilize it in my private cloud or in some cases a bit of a public cloud, but I'm certainly putting it together myself. What the hyperscale cloud providers did is they took those frameworks, those capabilities, and some very smart development engineers on their side and code developers and they created a function environment where I now I can take my business logic, I can take my unique script, I can take my unique piece of code, and I can deploy it into their functions world and just let them worry about everything that it's going to take to make that run. Between you and me, there's a big container environment behind the scenes making that happen. But you know what? Whether you knew that or not, your functions environment are going to run because we have abstracted this world where... Um, where we had to think about and manage that platform infrastructure, and now I can just worry about my code. Now what that's also taken us to is a world where we aren't necessarily even just thinking about DevOps, where I have to think about that entire deployment world. Now what we're thinking about is a continuous improvement, continuous deployment environment. Because I've broken my code down into such granular functions, if you will, I'm now able to, to deal with... Um, uh, and enjoy the benefits that come from a CI CD world. Now there are frameworks in place to help you make that happen. There are code bases that you can attach to and utilize to make this happen, but it is absolutely at a code level. It is absolutely at a functional level, and it's one that can be managed and, uh, and dealt with in an environment where uh, where it fits our business process. It, it, it fits our business needs from a company perspective. It is malleable in that context to, to be able to adapt it to our business world. So uh, in the functions world, we're now not even thinking about managing the platform that runs those microservices. The hyperscale cloud providers are doing that for us. We're now able to fully adopt a CI CD pipeline that is going to be, uh, that's going to fit our business world and it is going to then be adapted to and placed on top of our, um, uh, our, our development process. And, uh, and then as we move into that last world where we have, we have stopped thinking about the infrastructure that makes this stuff run, is we're now in a data world. Because all of those capabilities in the functions world not only are going to create an output for us, uh, and provide the features and capabilities that our application need. It's also creating an awful, amount, uh, an awful lot of data that allows us to then make future decisions about our application. So we are truly moving into a data science space. How and when do these, these functions run? When are there peaks and valleys to this world? Are there, uh, is there specific geos that are hitting our space uh, on a continual basis? 
or on a periodic basis? What are, what are those uh, those those periods that make it happen? Uh, are there um, uh, based on these spikes in traffic? Are there geographies that are more cost compelling for us to run our application in, as opposed to necessarily running it in U.S. Central, where we just so happen to may perhaps have our corporate headquarters? But we can start to make decisions about our application, not just from a, does it run right or does it serve our customers well, but how does it run? Uh, and in what places does it run better for us from a business perspective? You see, what's happening as we moved into this this data-driven world is we're thinking about our business as our business, not necessarily thinking about servers because, well, we're forced to thinking about servers. Because what's happened along the way is we have created this abstraction layer that has deepened and deepened as the wave has grown. And by the way, each of these waves, in case you haven't figured this out, they build on the other. We couldn't have moved to a virtualized world if we didn't have services. We couldn't have truly adopted a microservices architecture unless we were in a virtualized world. Functions and a truly data-driven application couldn't have existed without all of those other previous ways. But what's happened as the wave has gone higher, if we're going to truly be to death this, this wave and ocean and water metaphor, is we have moved farther and farther from the, the floor of the ocean and the floor of the ocean being running a server somewhere on, a, on a, the floor of a data center. And now we're riding on the capability of this technology that it exists between us and the floor. All right, so if we're not thinking about infrastructure and we're not thinking about patching servers, what are we thinking about? What are these values? What do we get when we abstract this stuff? Well, it has the potential, and I should have put into parentheses here, it has the potential for us to run our application uh, more cost effectively. We are increasing the flexibility in our application. We are increasing, absolutely we are increasing the capability that we have available to us. And all of this is wrapped up in the increased capability and our reliance on automation. I want to deal with a couple of these really quick before we move on to the next uh, bit of this presentation. Less expensive. All right, show of hands. And I'd like to say that I could see you through some magic of the internet. Um, show of hands, who has heard that moving to the cloud will save you money? Okay, everyone's hands went up. And that one guy on the left who didn't, you're lying. Because everybody, and that has been the core message of moving to the cloud. Move to the cloud, it'll be less expensive. If you just pick up your application in our phase one server or even virtualized world, and put it out into the cloud, I will guarantee you it is not going to be less expensive. I will guarantee you it will be more expensive. Well, why is it going to be more expensive? Well, it's going to be more expensive because picking up a, an always-on monolithic application and putting it into the cloud in an environment that was intended to be transactional, and by the way, the, the, the folks in finance uh, inside of these hyperscale worlds who figured out the pricing on a per minute basis, figured it out on a per minute basis or even a per second basis because they expected things to be transactional. And you put an always on application out there, you are paying a premium to move it out there. Now, do you have the ability to uh, dynamically have your servers scale up and scale down? Absolutely you do. And Kaz, does that have the opportunity to save you a couple of dollars? Sure, it could save you some dollars. Are you realizing the capability of the cloud? No, you are not. So when we moved, from phase one inside of servers into virtualization. We saw that uh, inside of the IT world as uh, beneficiary because it allowed us to run our uh, and utilize our servers in a much denser fashion. We can get more compute on a server. It saved us money in that context. context. It didn't necessarily give us lots of new capabilities. It just saved us some money and gave us a little bit of ability if the the, the folks who ran the VMware environment allowed us to, to script to it and add a little bit of automation. But we by and large saw it as a, as a waterfall version change. And so we knew when we went from running on servers to running in VMs, we saw that as a real estate change. Okay, this is an activity that we want to have done by the end of the year. Once it's done, we don't have to do it again until VMware or Microsoft comes out with a new version, and then we've got to do some kind of an upgrade to our VMs to utilize the new uh, servers that it's going to run on. But we saw this as a periodic activity. We're going to measure it in years of when we have to do it. But, uh, but ultimately, it wasn't 
something that necessarily baked itself into our development life cycle. But if we fast forward down into this functions world, into a data-driven application, where we have truly broken up our application to run inside of the public cloud, and not just picking up VMs and running them inside of the cloud, but breaking our applications up into a microservices and a functions-based application, a true what we will call a serverless environment. Well, what we've done is we've said, we have, we have raised our hand and we have said, we are going to adopt the, the, the hyperscale cloud mantra that there is more capability that exists there than I could necessarily build on my own. And I can pretty honestly say to you as I sit and deliver this webinar to you from San Antonio, Texas, that that, that is a very true statement, that there really isn't, there, there, there's, uh, there, there might be uh, five organizations on the globe who have the wherewithal and the gumption to develop their own truly private environment that has some of the capabilities that exist in the public cloud. But in reality, the rest of us are going to go out to the public cloud to utilize their environment. For instance, there is probably isn't an organization on the planet that is going to do what Google has done in their database environment that is going to give you a true global uh, GPS bound uh, data environment with, with guarantees of data replication in the nanosecond, um, measured in nanoseconds. We're just not going to do that because it doesn't make sense for us to do it independently when it's already been done for us. In fact, that's one of the things that the cloud has done for us, and that is one of my favorite phrases, it, it has democratized computing. Some people say it's democratized the cloud, but it's not what it's done. What it's done is democratized computing. What it's done is it says that that startup running in, in a, uh, somebody's garage or in basement in Minnesota uh, it has the same compute capabilities available to them as the largest Fortune 10 company does in the world if they're all utilizing uh, either Microsoft or Google or AWS. Because they do. With a swipe of a credit card, they have all of those capabilities available to them. So. Um, uh, the same development team running at Goldman Sachs or running at Walmart has the same capability as, you know, Bob's Bait Shop running on, uh, that, that wants to sell their unique uh, Red Wrigglers all around the world. Strange example, but the, but the point is, is the, the public cloud has democratized computing to the world. So when we say that the cloud is less expensive, it's less expensive because we have broken our applications up. It has given us the ability to run now in a functions-based environment where our, our, our capabilities and our services are broken down into individual segments. And because it's done that, we can now grade the computing and monitor that uh, computing instance as it is consumed on a transaction-by-transaction -transaction basis. It has given us the ability to, um, to grade an application's uh, function and benefit based on now I can actually do a dollars and cents comparison. So in your large organization, here's a specific example, when marketing says we're going to run a Super Bowl ad, and that Super Bowl ad is going to drive half a million visitors to our website. So, so the CMO goes walking down to the CIO's office and says, good news coming this, this coming February when the, when the Super Bowl runs we are going to run an ad and it's going to drive half a million views, half a billion views to our website. Isn't that great? I need you to plan now for all the compute for that. Well, because the CIO is so smart, because the CIO has had the wherewithal and the brains to go and utilize the public cloud and to break his applications up into functions and now become a truly data-driven application, he can, from a data-driven perspective, look back at that CMO and say, Great. Okay, so for every view that comes in, it's going to cost 0.04 cents for us to run that. I know that because I know what my transactional costs are across this website and for somebody to come in and view all of our wares and actually place an order. And we know what our, our margin is on those, uh, applic uh, those, those products that we're selling. So can you guarantee the quality of the person that's coming in to be able to cover the expense that it's going to cost for us to run it? Because the brilliant CIO and CTO can now sit across from the CMO and say, for every visitor that you bring into this website, classified as potential buyer, possible buyer, or definitely going to buy, and they're going to buy these products from us, or at least come in and, and show some interest in the long term as we build brand, can you guarantee they're going to be, be these folks? So now the CMO actually has to go and have a conversation with sales and actually have a real 
conversion conversation. You know what a conversion conversation is? It's not how do I, uh, what it is, is it's, it's how do I turn that, that suspect into a prospect into a buyer. And it's less about where it was for what feels like a millennia, but really was just a couple of decades uh, in our true client server world where, where we really just cared about can we actually respond to all the requests that are coming in. Now we're not necessarily having a conversation around the technology of can we respond to the requests that are coming in, but can we convert the requests that are coming in into true advocates of our business and uh, consumers of our products. And so what's happened is, as you look at the little red section on this slide where it says the abstraction layer, it's truly abstracting technology from the rest of the conversation. We can assume that Microsoft can build a, serve, a function uh, environment that can respond to the highest demands. We can assume that that exists also over on the, the of course, on the AWS and the, and, the, uh, and the Google side. We can assume that their data infrastructure is going to be able to respond to anything that we throw at it, given, of course, the right architecture. With that assumption in place, it's all on our shoulders from a business perspective. It's all on our shoulders to run our business. No longer do we get to utilize the crutch of uh, technology. It was a technology issue. There was a glitch there. There was an attack there. There's a denial of service there. There was a break in the code there. We can stop having that conversation and we can start having a conversation completely about can we run our business in a way and utilize technology in a way that it truly is a strategic differentiator. And I think that that's incredibly powerful because when we take our application and truly make it a modern cloud application, we just spent the past 30 minutes defining what that means through historical view of how we got where we are to the opportunity that exists for us now. If we truly turn our applications, our legacy applications into modern cloud applications, or, the, of course, the other piece of that is as we write new applications, we are writing them as truly modern cloud applications. Then we can, function, we can focus primarily on running our business and being the best in the world at our business as opposed to having to worry about the bits and bytes. We talk about the cloud democratizing um, technology. This is exactly what it's done. And it's done this for the largest uh, companies as well as the smallest companies. The smallest companies no longer have an excuse, by the way, to say, we are so small, we can't afford the opportunity that exists uh, in largest Fortune 10 companies in the world. Well, you know what? You have exactly the same capability. Now, granted, maybe you don't have as many developers as they have, but the underlying tool set that they have to operate on is exactly the same tool set. All right, I can see a hand go up out there, and that hand has a question, and that question is, but what about my private cloud, Jeff? Well, let's talk about your private cloud for a second, and let's ask the provocative question. Can a truly modern cloud application run in a private cloud? Well, now that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. My friend in the back with your raise, hand raised high proudly um, because you've got a significant investment in your private cloud. Well, let's, let's just address for a second the reason that a private cloud may still have a reason to exist. All right, reason number one, private clouds are awesome in the context that they allow you to put a little bit of automation, in some cases more automation, around your application to help minimize the overhead of running servers. Okay, there's value there, I get it. Why do I still need to run a private cloud? Well, I would say you need to run a private cloud for a couple of reasons. The first is, well, I will agree to the fact that some applications aren't worth modernizing. Say it again, some applications aren't worth modernizing. You, and a couple of reasons for that might be you are developing its replacement. Well, if I'm developing my application's replacement as a modern cloud application, you don't necessarily need to worry about that old application. Even though it may take a couple of years for this new modern application to truly be in a functional state. If you are measuring your application's life, life expectancy in just a, uh, a couple of years, it really may not be worth, worth updating because you've got a plan for it. And the reality is you don't necessarily have a plan for the application, you have a plan for the data. The data is the crown jewels in all of this. 
So you have a plan for the data. You may be breaking that up to run across multiple other new applications. It may be an antiquated application that, that serves a line of business that's going to go away. You may be selling that line of business in some period of time. If you're measuring your application's life cycle in just a year or two, it's probably not worth messing with. Put it on cheap infrastructure that just gets the job done and focus on things that move your business forward. Okay. So that's a good reason for a private cloud because the private cloud, just as in uh, what virtualization did for us in being able to run uh, more densely on servers, meaning I can get more compute running on a server because let's face it, your server applications don't run all the time. So let's put a bunch of VMs on a single server and try to get the most out of that, that, uh, out of that infrastructure that we bought. Um, so that's a good reason for a private cloud. Well, here's another reason that, that I've heard that private clouds still have um, some life expectancy, and that is you may need to run a modern application or cloud-based application in a geography where a public cloud doesn't exist. What are some of those examples? Microsoft did some good examples of these when they talked about um, their, their Azure Stack product, which I think is a fantastic product in being able to bring Azure to you. Uh, I think it's a fantastic way to get Azure into your data center or into a, ge into a geography where uh, our modern cloud might exist. And that geography could be something uh, provocative and interesting like a cruise ship. You know, here, here you've got this, this floating data center with thousands of people on it that needs applications to run uh, in environment where there is limited to no um, high-speed internet at large. Great, makes a whole lot of sense in that context. Um, I've also heard the example of the nuclear submarine, but that's a pretty out there example. Uh, or you may need to run in uh, some places in geographies like Africa or South America, uh, or uh, those are just those are some good examples. Let's leave it at that. Uh, where you may not be close from a latency perspective or close enough to be able to truly utilize your application. If your application is uh, capturing data from uh, 20 cars running around a space, a, a, a racetrack, and you're capturing uh, petabytes of data per lap, you know, you probably don't want to be shoving all of that over the internet. You want your modern application to store all that data as the race occurs and then be able to upload it later. So there are one-off environments where I think that the private cloud still has value, but if your future investment is bound to a private cloud, I think you really need to rethink your future. Um, they're, from a security perspective, you're not going to match what's happening in the public cloud. You don't have, and I feel pretty confident saying that, that five nines of you out there don't have the wherewithal to invest in a security infrastructure that is going to be beyond what the hyperscale cloud providers have done. You aren't going to be able to invest in a networking environment that is going to connect your private cloud data centers in a way that they have done, the hyperscale cloud providers have done. You aren't going to out-certify the public cloud providers from a government perspective or from a security perspective. There's just way too much that's been done and invested in in that space by those, those providers. So I am going to say uh, that uh, in, in uh, uh, one handful or two, instances, you may come up with a good reason to run in a private cloud. What I personally would encourage you to do is those is, is private clouds exist because companies and individuals love to be able to see and hug their servers, but they still want to say that they're in the quote cloud. I would encourage you to think about uh, breaking your application up into its individual components and as small as components as possible and start thinking about what your movement to the public cloud does. So benefits to Application modernization, I think I've got about five of them here, truly enables you to unlock an agile environment. Can you run agile in a monolithic application? Sort of. Can you in virtualize, a virtualized world? Sort of. But when you've broken everything down into its component parts, you are able to not only function in an agile uh, fashion, but you're able to function in an agile fashion at a component by component basis. And that has huge value. No longer do you have to, to if you have to update a single uh, uh, table or environment or piece of code inside of your monolithic application and go through extensive testing and deployment life cycles, now you can do that on a component by component basis and either fix or add a capability that didn't exist before. And I think that's incredibly powerful. Another benefit to it is uh, you are now able to, and this is an extension of Agile, but it's you're able from an Agile perspective, you're able to add and augment data to your environment and your application that you ne weren't necessarily able to do before. 
So what that means is as you move into a truly data-driven application, your data becomes inputs to other applications or you're now able to garner input to your application where you weren't necessarily before. So for instance, let's take the example that you are a shipping company and that shipping company has got sensors on all of your trucks that are driving things all around the United States as things get delivered. And, uh, and you have invested heavily in that infrastructure and in those sensors and in that in, uh, uh, and in the, uh, even understanding the people and the process and the HR systems that make all of that a reality so that ultimately you can forecast to your end customer when your package is going to show up at their door. Well, you know what? As new data sources exist, it can help augment your application's capability. For instance, uh, you can now take a data feed from a weather service provider that is able to, at a geographic level as well as an aerospace level, be able to know when there will be issues with the weather that may impact the delivery of that uh, package or that may cause you to think through how do you proactively reroute that package so that there isn't a service delivery. So that's one example of how you go and, and uh, take new data sources on an agile function and augment the capability of your application. Another benefit to application modernization is, and I, I addressed this earlier, is a transactional uh, billing capability for your application. Uh, in the old days in the client server world, in a virtualized world, I would measure my cost of my application in the infrastructure, in the licensing, uh, storage and networking, of course, part of the infrastructure, the people it takes to maintain it, and, uh, and then the developers that, that sit on top of that to keep it alive. In a transactional world, no longer do I have to take and figure Dell service contracts or HP service contracts or data center, um, uh, cost of cooling, um, cost of the, the building itself, cost of somebody to come in and clean that building. You don't think about any of that stuff anymore. What is my cost per transaction for the elements of my application? That's it. And now on top of that, it's the developers that it takes to maintain and to run that application. We get transactional. Transactional brings a ton of value to you from being able to ultimately abstract thinking about the cost of servers to now the capability and the options that exist for me in my, uh, in my company and actually running my business. I don't have to think about patching servers anymore. Oh, praise the Lord for that. Don't have to worry about patch day. I don't have to think about um, how, what the impact that's going to be from a downtime perspective. I don't have to manage the people who are going to do that. Does that mean I go fire those people? No, I redeploy them into places that matter for my application. They get to evolve in their skill set as our application skill set and capabilities increase. We don't have to secure those servers because if I'm thinking about functions, Microsoft or um, or Google or AWS has to think about all of those things. The patching, the upgrade, the security, the monitoring, all of those things are what the hyperscale cloud providers now have to think about and you don't have to think about anymore. Uh, that's a huge value. It's up to them to manage it. Can they do it? Well, that's another conversation that you need to have with your in choosing your cloud provider. Uh, by the way, that's a thing that CloudReach helps companies do all the time is choose the right cloud provider because they, there are unique differences between them. Uh, but ultimately what that does is it allows you to, to break those apart and to now uh, just rely on your hyperscale cloud provider to, to do those things for you. Um, again, it's around patching, it's around security, it's around the system administration for that. Is it running on Windows or Linux? Linux? I don't care. It doesn't matter to you. Does it do what you want it to do? That's the only thing you should really care about. Um, there, there, there may be some decisions about underlying infrastructure when we think about containers. Um, but again, that's now we're talking about capabilities of your application uh, and ultimately will be a line of code inside of the deployment of your application and your CI CD pipeline that's going to deploy exactly what you need for that. All right. Other benefits of application modernization is your ability to rewrite and modify aspects of your application uh, ad hoc as you need them. Now this is this, this little picture is a bit of an eye chart, but it's an example of an application that we worked on here. Uh, at our company around uh, a big data application where we're ingesting data sources uh, into an AWS um, uh, environment that utilizes some dynamically created servers that are monitoring and scaling based on size. It's running into um, uh, data buckets and those S3 data buckets are being monitored by Lambda functions. Those Lambda functions are making decisions on that data and, and 
pruning and uh, curating that data so that our ultimately our data-driven application has pristine data for us to make ultimately to to uh, to mine and to invest and to and to make decisions based on a serverless-based environment that uh, that helps us do that. So. Uh, again, uh, any of these areas, as we think about ways to improve them, we can in improve and modify the individual component completely outside of the entire function of the environment. Now, if I choose to, to update or change a key component of this, do I need to run uh, a functional testing across all of this? Of course I do. Um, if you're uh, making any changes, you want to make sure that, that the function that it was providing still ultimately gives me the core capability that I needed and also test the new capabilities. But when you have broken down to a functions-based environment that is, that is a data-driven application, now I can make those changes. And by the way, as you become a data-driven um, application, you can put functions in place that will do your testing uh, live, that will do live application testing along the way. For instance, if we're monitoring uh, if all the logs are being pulled into a common environment, let's say in Microsoft, we're going to pull that in maybe into an event grid and put it across a service bus. You know what? We can write an application that's going to monitor transaction times. We're going to monitor the number of transactions and report accordingly to, uh, to that stuff. In fact, we can look at, at, at uh, result codes as those transactions happen and make decisions based on what those result codes are. Do we see errors? Let's wake people up and fix things. Uh, or see if we can dynamically fix them uh, ourselves along the way. For instance, if there's a, an individual server component, we still have a, a need for a server along the way and it's responding slowly, let's dynamically create new servers outside of the functionality that might have done that for us on the cloud and rip them down as soon as we're done with them because I don't want to pay for them. Um, but when we become a truly data-driven environment, what we are left with is uh, now we can think about how this application benefits our business and how we can augment that application to benefit our business and give us a strategic advantage. Because while from a technologist perspective, doing this, going through this process of modernization is exciting and it's fun because we're geeks in this context and we like to have the new shiny thing to play with, uh, but at the end it's got to provide business value. And that business value really is the new shiny thing because we can use technology as a strategic strategic differentiator uh, against our uh, competitors. And so the smartest people that you can think about investing in your organization are people who think about this stuff all day long. How can I remove one piece of this architectural diagram and turn it into something else uh, that will create more value? And that value can be in um, greater visibility to your information, more granular data about your customer that you can make decisions on, lowering costs should be a piece of that, and ultimately then increasing revenue. So those main benefits to application modernization, move into a true agile development environment, agile data connections, transactional billing, less system administration, uh, and more time for you to focus on your business, and then granular updates and modifications. Well, gentle listener, this has been uh, a great time to, to get to talk about some of the stuff that I've spent, again, the greater part of the past couple of decades doing for a uh, countless number of companies as they've, and by the way, as, as I went through that whole waves of, of technology, as I've been involved in businesses that have done that for those companies and those waves all along. And I've talked about the business value of each of those all along the way. And that's why it's particularly exciting for me to now sit at where we are on this current wave, and that is the data wave, and to be able to look back and truly be able to understand what the value is along the way. So um, if you have any other questions or comments, please feel free to put them into the chat. There's been a few in there, and I've, I've addressed them along the way. Um, but one of the things I do want to talk about is you may be back in the client in the server um, in the server world waterfall world still. Don't be disheartened, but know that it's time to get to work. You don't even necessarily need to go through each phase. You can leapfrog some steps along the way if you want to. If you are running in your own data center or a service provider's data center, and you're running on traditional virtualization and you want to start to capture and utilize some of the power of the cloud, there are ways to very quickly do that. And my recommendation is to, first of all, make the move to the cloud, but have a roadmap for what it looks like to 
um, to break that cloud down into a functions-based environment, a serverless-based environment that uh, can very quickly then create some data value for you. Because this is one of the most important parts of this whole, whole thing as well is that it's important for you to understand that as opposed to the old world, when I gave the example before, when we moved from servers to virtualization, we looked at that as a real estate change. The move to the cloud very much as a real estate change. I'm moving from point A to point B. But what's ultimately happening is you are changing the methodology by which you will manage your applications. And that's a mind shift change. That is a business change combined with a real estate change. But what you have to have in mind, and this is one of the most important parts of this whole conversation, is that, that you will stop thinking about your changes to your application and your technology in this periodic waterfall real estate type of a change to a day-to-day, hour-by-hour, moment-by-moment capability change. Because you have that power available to you now, and to not utilize it is, uh, is, is, is foolhardy uh, because it's there for you, and it absolutely can uh, create business value for you. It can create a strategic differentiator between uh, you and your competitors. And by the way, your competitors today are now not the, or aren't the competitors that you had yesterday. They still are there, those other ones. But because of the, the, the shrinking of the world, because of the internet and hyperscale cloud providers, it is now taking uh, and creating competitors for you outside of your geography where you didn't realize you had them. And it is... Um, uh, making competitors out of people you didn't realize existed because that one and two and five member company who are uh, you know coding away in their garage or in their their rental we work space uh, have the same capabilities that you at, at top of your game in your environment could be changing the world the specific example around that is nobody ever considered taking Amazon on from a uh, a, a uh, an online shopping environment before. But you know what? Jet sure gave them a run for their money with incredibly small investment comparatively and ended up being the engine that is fueling Walmart's attempt to, uh, to unseat uh, Amazon in that space or at least give them a run for their money. Okay, um, last, last chance at typing in any questions before we pull the plug on this today. Uh, I really am uh, humbled and uh, grateful that you spent the past hour with me. We've had a great audience here today. Uh, hopefully you found some value in this. I know it will be available in the Bright Talk Network in the future. So if you have uh, want to go back and catch up on some of these uh, items that you didn't have, uh, didn't, didn't hear today, or want to remember, or share with someone else, they will be available in the Bright Talk Network. Uh, if you have any questions for me specifically, uh, you can reach out to me uh, uh, via CloudReach. I'm known on Twitter as at jdeverter, J-D-E-V-E-R-T-E-R. You can find me there. Please feel free to follow me there over on LinkedIn. Uh, again, my name is Jeff Deverter, and uh, thanks for being here with us today. This has been a great uh, presentation, uh, and I hope you have enjoyed it. Have a great day. Bye.